In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Austin. Great job. Didn't he do a great job? It's only his second time doing that, and I think he did so great, not just because he mentioned Star Wars, but that was, he did a great job on that. Interesting point, we are going to be there where they filmed Tatooine, and we will be there on May 4th, just saying. May the 4th be with you. I mean... One more announcement I want to let you know about before I jump into the message today. Next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday. Next, next Sunday is February 27th, and at 5.30 in the afternoon, we're going to be having our annual church business meeting, and you're all invited. This is basically an open board meeting. This annual church business meeting is run by our board of trustees, facilitated by our chairman. And it's really re give you a report of the last year. Uh, you can see everything that's happened financially, what we've been doing program-wise, initiatives and various things. Be an opportunity for you to ask questions of the current board, our treasurer, and so on. Uh, this is your church. And so everything is completely open to you, transparent to you. We will have all the information there that you might need that night. If we don't have it there that night, we will be able to make an appointment for you to come in and get whatever information uh, that would help you feel good about what's going on in the church right now. So that's next Sunday night. You're invited to come. You don't have to come, but you're invited to come if you'd like to get an update and be a part of our annual church business meeting. Okay, I'm jumping back into Esther. Last Sunday, we had to take a little break, although I did weave Esther in brilliantly. Um, <laughs> you know, it was that we, we paused for our halftime update and our miracles initiative, and we're jumping back into Esther chapter five today. Here is my challenge. I have this Sunday and next Sunday to finish the book of Esther. There are 10 chapters in the book of Esther, and I'm in chapter five today. And I'm supposed to do chapter five, six, and seven today, and eight, nine, and 10 next week, but I'm not gonna do that because I got stuck in chapter five. So I don't know what's gonna happen. The Holy Spirit's gonna do something great next week. I think probably this is a little bit of judgment on myself. I'm being judged because, you know, the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. And Jarrett McConnell, who does our adult uh, ministry has been teaching on Wednesday night, and he's been going through a teaching in the book of Revelation for the past 70 weeks. <laughs> and I've given him a little trouble about that. I told him that John wrote Revelation faster than he's teaching it. <laughs> and now I myself am stuck. I'm finding myself guilty of the very thing. So let that be a lesson to all of us. Esther chapter five, what I wanna do before I jump into the portion of scripture today is just give you a brief recap since it has been a little bit since we've been in this. The theme of the book of Ex Esther is God's provision and protection for his people. The main idea is this, God's providence is greater than our sin or our circumstances. God's ability to accomplish his will and his purposes is bigger than my sin or my circumstances, amen? And so one of the things that does to encourage me is to always make it my goal, my, my, my focus to please him because his purposes always prevail. I don't wanna fight against his purposes because his purposes always prevail. And what I mean by providence is this. It's, it's God's foresight and his making provision for beforehand. God knows what's gonna happen. He makes provision for that. It does not mean that it's some kind of impersonal force controlling us like robots and that what we do has no consequence and it doesn't matter that we're just robots. It does not mean that. We are responsible for our actions and our actions do matter. But it does mean that God's will, his purpose will be done and accomplished according to what he has designed. That's, that's, the, that's the point. And here in the fifth chapter, we're gonna see a, a stunning foreshadowing of the work of Christ for us. Even as we learn about uh, love and the Lord's tendencies to give his enemies, I love this, he, he gives his enemies an, enough rope to basically hang themselves. We'll, we'll see that in this, in this passage. We've come so far, but there are four main characters just to refresh you on. The first main character is King Ahasuerus, or in uh, Greek it would be King Xerxes. He rules the Persian Empire at its peak, about three million square miles. And the thing about Ahasuerus is he's a kind of a drunken pushover. And he's an unjust man uh, who misuses, mistreats people in his life, including his wife Vashti, and then disposes of her when she refuses to be exploited. Uh, he, he basically wants to exploit her in front of a bunch of people, and she's like, no, and he disposed of her. 
I mean, this is the kind of person he is. The second character is Esther, who the book is named for, and she's a beautiful young Jewish woman who winds up a part of basically this beauty contest to replace Vashti. And uh, in, this, in this contest, and as they go through this process, she finds such favor with King Ahasuerus that he actually makes her queen. Also, we see in that same chapter, the third character, which is Mordecai, and Mordecai is Esther's uncle, and uh, he ends up raising Esther as his own daughter after her, after she's orphaned, and he's, he and Esther both are Jewish, but they've concealed their identity, especially as Esther got into this, this contest. Also, this is important to reference because it pl- comes into play next week, hopefully, um, in chapter two, Mordecai overhears some people plotting to kill the king. And so he tells Esther, because now she has opportunity and, and she has an audience with the king and she could do something about it. So over, Mordecai overhears this plot to kill the king, tells Esther, Esther goes in and tells the king, hey, this Mordecai has overheard this plot and so he ends up you know, having the people arrested and, and they end up being um, executed and he wants to honor Mordecai. And this is now all recorded in the book of the annals. So this is important. So this is recorded there. This all happens in chapter, chapter two. Mordecai also refuses to bow down to the th- third character who's the evil character. He's this guy called Haman. Well done. Good job, good job. Those of you that don't know what's going on. Um, it is traditional. Uh, during the Feast of Purim, when the story of Esther is read, every time the name of Haman is mentioned, everybody boos because he is the bad guy. He is basically the the embodiment of satanic opposition to God's people. And Mordecai refuses to pay homage to Haman, and and this is important. You don't actually have to do that, okay? You made your point. Come on, now. You'll distract me, and I'm easily distracted. Um, so, where was I? <laughs> See what I mean? Um, so, so, Haman, is a, he's an Agagite. He's a descendant of the Amalekites. And Mordecai is Jewish, and he's a descendant of, he's a Benjamite, a descendant of Saul. And, and so there's this ongoing, lifelong tension there. And, Mor- and Haman literally resents and hates Mordecai. And Mordecai refuses to bow down and to pay homage to Haman. And Haman's just furious about this. So he winds up tricking this pushover king to issue a decree to kill all the Jews on the 12th month, which is 11 months after this is happening. And the way he comes up with that date is by rolling a dice called a poor. That's why, that's why the, piece is called, the feast is called Purim. So he rolls this dice called a poor, and that's how they choose. 11 months from now, all the Jews are gonna be killed. Now in chapter four, Mordecai says to Esther, you have an opportunity to do something about this. It's time for us to reveal our identity. You have an opportunity to say something to the king and to change this evil decree. And Esther's concerned about it because if you approach the king and you weren't invited, it's by Persian law, it's execution. Unless the king has some kind of mercy on you and extends the golden scepter, but if he does not, you're executed, that's Persian law. So Esther knows this is very risky. And, and so she says this to Mordecai, and he says, you know what, though? You're in a unique position, and who knows that, that you've come to the kingdom for exactly such a time as this. That's what's happening there in chapter four. And now we're gonna pick it up in chapter five. Now Esther says this at the end of, kind of at the end of chapter four, when she decides, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna say something to the king, I'm gonna take a stand, and she gets her people to fast and pray, and there's this famous line that Esther says. She says, I'm gonna do it, and if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. It's such a famous line that it's actually been used in tough guy movies. I mean, watch some kind of tough guy movie, and like, if I die, I die, you know, and they go in there, all kinds of accents, you know, you hear all, all these different movies they use this, but it comes right from Esther right here. She says this, so brave. And then we're gonna look here in chapter five, verse one. After they've been fasting and praying now for three days, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in the front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance of the palace. Let me just pause right there there for a moment. 
Architecture actually speaks volumes. Architecture is sort of like a, it's kind of a human language from castles to cathedrals to even in modern times like the, um, the, the Sydney Opera House in Australia or SoFi Stadium that we all saw last Sunday during the Super Bowl, right? I mean, that's some serious architecture that has purpose and intention. It's communicating something. You walk into a, a cathedral, like the cathedrals around Rome or there in the Vatican, you walk in and instantly you're drawn to thinking about the majesty and mystery of God, the awesomeness of God. There's a, a reverence that comes over you. You want to be quiet. You want to kneel and pray, right? The, just the architecture communicates that. Architecture communicates something, even all the way down to the way people design their own offices. It's communicating something. I, I, love, I love movies, and one of the movies I love during Christmas is a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. You guys ever heard of it? Yeah, just checking to see if you're still awake. Um, <laughs> In this movie, George Bailey goes in to see Mr. Potter, who's the Haman of the movie. <laughs> he, goes in, he goes in to see him, and when he sits down in Mr. Potter's office, his office is designed to intimidate everybody, to make everybody feel less than him. So there's this seat he sits in, he's way down, and the desk is big, and Mr. Potter's up there, and you know, he's trying to position himself differently, right? Because it's, it communicates something. Well... It'll help us to see the gravity of what Esther is risking if we can picture the setting a little bit. The whole point of this throne room that Xerxes is in is to intimidate, to communicate that uh, he is, to, to show his, all of his glory, that it's on display. He's even referred to as the king of kings. It was a massive hall full of Great pillars carved from stone standing 65 feet high with every line of sight designed to converge on the throne of the king. That's what you're walking into. I mean, this is more intimidating than Dorothy going up to Oz. I mean, she's, she's walking into this setting also knowing that she's risking her life because she's un. She's, been un, she's not been summoned, she's been, not been invited. She's approaching him uninvited. This could be her life. And verse two, when Esther saw, excuse me, when the king saw Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to half my kingdom. This is very interesting. The king shows her favor, right? So I'm sure right now he's feeling, he's feeling powerful. He sees this beautiful woman, his queen, and, and he's probably feeling very benevolent. But what he doesn't understand is something we do understand. Proverbs tells us that even the heart of the king is like a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it where he will. Though God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther one time, he is undoubtedly the main character of the book, weaving together every detail. And it's interesting to me that when Esther gets to this moment, she's risked everything, she's come right there, he extends a scepter and he says, what do you want? I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom. Right then, she could say, well, actually, I'm Jewish. And you know that decree that you mentioned, yeah, that you issued to kill all the Jews? Maybe we could rethink that. Maybe you might, can you modify it a little? She doesn't do that. She doesn't say anything there. Why doesn't she? He says, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And Esther says, verse four, if it pleases the king, then let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine at the feast, the king said to Esther, remember, he's kind of this drunken pushover. Here he is getting all liquored up again. What is, is it, what, what, what's your wish? What, what do you want? I'll, I'll give it to you, up, up to half my kingdom. What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Again, Esther doesn't say, I got him right where I want him. He's, he's a little bit tipsy. He's showing me a lot of favor. Now I'm gonna, he doesn't do that. She doesn't say that. What does she say? She says, 
Then Esther, then Esther answered, my wish and my request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if the king is pleased and if it pleases the king to grant my wish and to fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to a feast that I will prepare for them tomorrow. And then I will do as the king has asked. This is very important and we'll really see how this comes into play next week. Why is this delay so important? One of the things that's going to happen is in the beginning of chapter six, King Xerxes goes home after this banquet and can't sleep that night. And so he's awake like, you know, a lot of us when you're sleeping, when you're trying to go to sleep at night and you can't go to sleep, your mind won't shut down. You try to, you try to read something, or you try to watch something, you try to listen to something, right? So he, he says to one of his attendants, go get the book of the annals and bring them in and just read it to me. He can't sleep. And so the attendant begins to read him the book of the annals and he reads how Mordecai was the one that uncovered the plot to kill the king that Mordecai actually saved his life. And so the king is like, I need to do something for this guy. So that's what's about to happen. That's one reason this delay is so important, how we see God working in all these details. She plans this private feast. And even though we see how God's gonna work in the delay, it's also brilliant because think about her husband and his character. And he is absolutely stuffed with a vainglorious kind of, receipt, uh, of conceit. He's arrogant, proud, full of himself. Put his wife Vashti away because she embarrassed him publicly. So Esther is like, if I tell the king that he made a mistake with this decree in front of everybody, he's gonna be embarrassed. He's gonna have to save face. Let me plan a private banquet. Let me do this in private, right? So she's actually really smart in what she's doing. There's a very important lesson here for us that also is echoed again in Proverbs, and that is this. That it, the, the proverb says a, a, a word spoken at the right time is like apples of gold in settings of silver. In other words, a few words at the right time are more valuable and impactful than a lot of words at the wrong time. Timing and setting will help you be successful in communication. If you try to forge ahead and have certain conversations in the wrong time at the wrong place, it's not gonna go well. Anybody that's married, can I get an amen? amen. We've all done it, right? It's better to have the right time and the right setting. And, and so it, this is important. You don't wanna try to get into something really intense and work through it and, and present something that's really when you're hungry <laughs> or when you're tired. Or when, you know what I mean? I mean, Barb had to learn this lesson. I've had to really be graceful with her. Man, when she gets hungry. No, I'm just kidding. That's me. And everybody that knows me knows it. Apparently, people knew it long before I knew it about myself. But, I mean, there'll be times we're driving down the road. I'm like, rah, rah, snapping. Why are you snapping like that? Did you eat lunch today? No, I just was in a meeting. All right, pull over. <laughs> Not talking anymore. Get some food. I'll talk to that person. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde thing or something, you know? And, uh, but, here's the, but the point is, it's, it's true. A few words at the right time in the right setting are better than a lot of words at the wrong time in the wrong setting. And we could talk about all kinds of things, but when something's really important, it might be better to learn from Esther's example here and create an environment that you're going to be more successful. You don't, you don't, you let a person, you know, and she was, she was really actually, she understands, like, I need to show regard and respect to him and set this up this way and then create this scenario where it's gonna be more easily for him to receive what it is I have to say because it's so important. So Esther does, she invites them to the banquet and here's what happens in verse nine. Haman, remember Haman is also full of all kinds of pride. Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. And when Haman saw Mordecai at the gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him. He was filled with wrath against Mordecai. So he's walking out, he's feeling so proud of himself, so full of himself, everybody's bowing down, but not Mordecai. And he's just so, he, he can't even enjoy his success because he's so bitter and angry that Mordecai won't bow down to him. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh, and Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, 
the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced above all the officials and all the servants of the king. So here's the deal. So after Esther has this feast with the two of them, he goes home and he calls everybody over to brag about himself. He calls everybody over and recounts to them all of his riches, and I have 10 sons, and I've been elevated to the highest position. Who is more important than me? That's Haman's attitude. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she's prepared. And tomorrow, I am also invited by her with the king. Yet, all this is worth nothing to me so long as Mordecai the Jew is sitting at the king's gate. Hatred and unforgiveness will prevent you from enjoying anything. And he says, then, then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, you know what you should do? Let, build a gallows 50 cubits high. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman. And he had the gallows built. This is all happening the same night, the king is not gonna be able to sleep. And he's gonna hear about Mordecai, how he saved his life. So while Haman is now planning to kill Mordecai, the king is now planning to honor him. Not yet even knowing his heritage and his Jewishness. And that is the end of chapter five. And we're gonna pick it up there in chapter six, but here's the transition I need to make for the next few minutes that I feel is very important to all of us personally. The Bible, at every twist and turn, is about the gospel. The Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. Even as we read this story and we read this narrative, there is something that it is pointing us to, this meta-narrative that it's pointing us to. In the story of Esther, we see this very same thing, and I'll explain it this way. In the story of Esther, the people of God are under a sentence of death. They're living under a death sentence. Every day, this, this decree has been issued. They are living under a death sentence. We too are living under a death sentence. Romans chapter three says, verse 23, it says that um, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Right? We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then a few chapters later in chapter six, Paul says, and the wages of sin is death. We're under a death sentence. This is what we've earned because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, by the way, this is like a very important theological, uh, this is very important theological language here, but we often misunderstand falling short of the glory of God. Like we're trying to reach for God's glory. We just almost there, we just fall short. That actually isn't the context of this or what it's meaning. It's meaning instead of pursuing the glory of God, we've settled for lesser glories. We pursue other things that are lesser and we settle for lesser glories and lesser gods and that sin and the wages of sin is death. We're under a death sentence just like these people. This is what the Bible is leading us to and revealing to us. You know, when Jesus, after he rose, is walking on the road to Emmaus and is explaining the gospel to his disciples, he, he was using, it says that it, beginning with the law and the prophets, he began to explain to them how the Christ was supposed to suffer these things, how all this was pointing to the Messiah. When the apostle Paul is preaching the gospel, he wasn't using the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He wasn't using the letters of James and Peter. When the apostle Paul was preaching the gospel, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was using the Old Testament scripture to show how it was pointing us to these things. There are real historic things that happen, but there are also types and shadows that are revealing something to us, a foreshadowing of what would be happening in Christ. Like the people of God in the story of Esther, under a death sentence, we too need a, medi a mediator. They needed a mediator. They needed somebody that was actually in both worlds. So here are the Jewish people under this death sentence. Now here's Esther, Jewish, but also in the royal court. She was in both worlds. She could mediate between those. So you see where that's going about how it leads us to Jesus who was 
he became human just as us, yet he was still a part of the royal court. He was fully man in every way, but not just fully man. In order to be the mediator, he was also fully God. He's the one that could stand between. That's what actually the Bible says in 1 Timothy. It says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all of us. It's, it's pointing us to that, that Jesus was fully God, but he also fully identified with us in our humanity. He, he had the same kind of flesh and blood, the nerve endings and pain, and he even took on our sin. Esther risked her life. Jesus gave his. She faced the wrath of an earthly ruler. Jesus bore the wrath of the cosmic ruler. Like Esther, the plan of God's enemies will always backfire on them. And we'll see that play out with Haman, how his plan actually backfires on him. We see that in the gospel. We see that in the New Testament, that the enemies of God's plan always Backfire on there's this there's this portion of scripture in Acts chapter four that kind of unpacks this for us. The church at the time is being persecuted, and yet God keeps frustrating the attempts of the world to stop the spread of the gospel. And so the believers gather and pray for continuing boldness. We see this even today around the world, where the underground church in parts of the world like China, where people are persecuted for their faith, they don't pray that it stop. They pray for courage and boldness. They ask us to pray for them, for courage and boldness, that they, they take their stand and, and the church spreads. Even as, it's, even as the attempt to shut it down and persecute it, it spreads. And that's what you see here as they begin to reflect on this in Acts, and, and they actually, they, they say this in Acts chapter four, they're actually quoting part of Psalm two, but this is what they say. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they go on to say in that same chapter, for truly this city, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In other words, these enemies of God that are trying to shut it down, they don't know that they're actually working right into his plan. They didn't realize that. And here in the book of Acts, these believers are remembering that and recounting that and even looking at scripture and saying, God even told us it would be this way. All the enemies of God, Herod, Pilate, the rulers, conspiring against the Lord, but all the time it would be it would backfire on them. Listen to how it says it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter two. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. If the rulers of this age had understood it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind can conceive, the things God has prepared for those who love him. So let me conclude it this way. What we see in the book of Esther is a real historical echo of the gospel story, an echo of Christ's mediating work for us. So what are we supposed to do with this when we notice it, when we see these story arcs and types and shapes and echoes of the gospel in the Bible and we're reading these Old Testament stories? What do, what do we do with that? What are we supposed to do with that? Well, one is we are supposed to marvel at God's sovereignty and his hand over history. We're supposed to see that the whole story of human history and scripture is about God's kingdom and the Messiah. We're supposed to recognize that. Like it helps us to stop and marvel at that, to honor and reflect on that, to understand that God is, so that means even right now, that God's hand, that he is sovereign even over everything that's happening right now, even though we can't see it at the moment. Just like at, at certain times in the this, in this story, they couldn't see it. I mean, when, when uh, COVID-19 was introduced to the world, God did not fall off his throne and go, oh, myself. He's still in control, 
right? When, when things happen in politics and economics and all that, it might shock us, but it doesn't shock him. So this can help us to remember he's sovereign. So I marvel at that and I put my trust in him. We are also intended, what else, it, what else we're supposed to do with that is we are intended to be echoes of the Lord as well. Jesus said himself in John chapter 13, he goes, look, I've washed your feet and I've set you this an example that you behave as I have. Here's what he says, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Our life is supposed to be an echo that reveals Jesus. Peter said, Christ also suffered for you. Christ suffered for you. Christ laid his life down. He suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. The Old Testament is filled with types and shadows and pictures of Jesus. But the story of the church is also to serve as another kind of typology, a living story of the gospel right now. That's what we are. And it's a pattern for us to trust God and to love others. Now, there's an attribute of God that, that shines so brightly in the center of the gospel. And Esther puts it on display here for our instruction in chapter five. And it's a, it's a picture of authentic, sacrificial love. And we know in 1 John chapter four that God is love. Here's what John says, beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, I've said this before a few times over the last few years. And this is one of those things I will repeat again and again because I want it drilled down in myself and I want to drill it down in you. Some things in life are loved because they're valuable, like a new car. You get a brand new new car, you, that's valuable to you. The way you wax it, you care for it, you park, you know, I'm not parking under that tree, I'm gonna park over here. You get, you get the membership to the car wash thing so you can drive through there and get a car wash, you know, and then you go in there, vacuum it out, you gotta, don't leave your stuff in here, you're keeping your car all nice, right? Because it's valuable to do so you love it. Some things are loved because they're valuable. Other things are valuable because they're loved like a child's toy or your little daughter's blanket that's so important to her when you put her down for a nap, you're gonna go searching everywhere for that because you gotta have her blanket. She loved that every time you see that blanket, you feel affection for it because she loves it. Some things are valuable because they're loved. That's the kind of love the Bible talks about. Not loving something or someone because I'm gonna get something from them, but I wanna add value to them. That's how God loves us. That's the kind of love God has for us. That's the kind of love we see here in 1 John chapter four. God's agape love, even when we don't deserve it, we can't earn it because we've all sinned. We've all rejected the God who created us at some time. We've turned our back on him. We've denied him, decided to go our own way. And with our backs turned, rejecting him, he still sent Jesus as Messiah to redeem us. That love, the love God demonstrated for us, a love that was not and is not based on who we are or what we've done, it's based on who he is. That kind of love changes everything. That's what John three sixteen is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What are we supposed to do? Trust God and love one another. Receive that kind of love, that's the way he loved us. Now I wanna love in a way that adds value. Not that seeks value, but that adds value. Would you stand with me? We're gonna pray here in just a moment and come to communion. Pastor David's gonna come and lead us in communion. We receive communion every Sunday, but this is the gospel. This is what it was all pointing to, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 
We are in right standing with God. We have a covenant with God because of what Jesus did for us. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this so that you don't forget this. Do this so that you don't start trying to act like you have to earn it or deserve it. Do this because it reminds you of how much I love you and how valuable you are to me. Do this in remembrance of me. So we do this every Sunday. Before we do that, we wanna pray a prayer just acknowledging that we all have sinned. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and I'll say a couple of generic things like about our thoughts, our words and our actions, but don't let it be generic when you pray it. You think about the things in your own mind, in your own heart. And as we confess that, let's confess that before the Lord. And then we're gonna pray a prayer of surrender, a prayer of salvation, just yielding to Jesus as our Messiah. Then we'll have communion together. Would you bow your hearts? I'll lead you, you repeat after me, but you pray it and you mean it in faith. Let's pray this, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you and my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you, be my Lord. And Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.